welcome to our program, The Way Will Work Blockchain. My name is Rachel Swoboda, and I'm the Library to Business Coordinator at the Laramie County Library System. The L2B program assists entrepreneurs, small businesses, nonprofits, job seekers, and those seeking money management resources through personal consultations and programming just like tonight. We also have several partners that have made this program possible. First, the Wyoming State Library. Our, our Wyoming State Library serves state government agencies, Wyoming libraries, and residents of the Cowboy State. It's the mission of the WSL to provide exceptional library service and resources to our patrons so that all Wyomingites may have the opportunity to succeed personally, professionally, academically, and in the community. Tonight's recorded program will be available on the WSL website within the next couple of weeks. Tonight's program is also a part of our current exhibition, The Way We Worked. The Way We Worked is an exhibition created by the National Archives and is also a part of Museum on Main Street, which is a collaboration between the Smithsonian Institution and State Humanities Councils nationwide. Support for Museum on Main Street has been provided by the United States Congress. The way we worked has been made possible in Cheyenne by Wyoming Humanities. In order to get it kicked off, we have found the best video on YouTube ever. And it's called Understand the Blockchain in Two Minutes. When you vote, have you ever wondered whether your ballot is actually counted? If you meet someone online, how do you know they're who they say they are? When you buy coffee that's labeled Fairtrade, what makes you so certain of its origin? To be sure, really sure, about any of those questions, you'd need a system where records could be stored, facts could be verified by anyone, and security is guaranteed. That way, no one could cheat the system by editing records, because everyone using the system would be watching. Systems like this are on the horizon, and the software that powers them is called a blockchain. Blockchains store information across a network of personal computers, making them not just decentralized, but distributed. This means no central company or person owns the system, yet everyone can use it and help run it. This is important because it means it's difficult for any one person to take down the network or corrupt it. The people who run the system use their computer to hold bundles of records submitted by others, known as blocks, in a chronological chain. The blockchain uses a form of math called cryptography to ensure that records can't be counterfeited or changed by anyone else. You've probably heard of the blockchain's first killer app, a form of digital cash called Bitcoin that you can send to anyone, even a complete stranger. Bitcoin is different from credit cards, PayPal, or other ways to send money because there isn't a bank or financial middleman involved. Instead, people from all over the world help move the digital money by validating others' Bitcoin transactions with their personal computers, earning a small fee in the process. Bitcoin uses the blockchain by tracking records of ownership over this digital cash, so only one person can be the owner at a time and the cash can't be spent twice, like counterfeit money in the physical world can. But Bitcoin is just the beginning for blockchains. In the future, blockchains that manage and verify online data could enable us to launch companies that are entirely run by algorithms, making self-driving cars safer, help us protect our online identities, and even track the billions of devices on the Internet of Things. These innovations will change our lives forever, and it's all just beginning. To learn more about the urgent future of the blockchain, please visit iftf.org slash blockchain futures lab. Please welcome our moderator for this evening, Dennis Ellis, TechSpark Community Engagement Manager for the Microsoft Corporation. Dennis? Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis Ellis. I'm a, the TechSpark Manager for Microsoft based here in Cheyenne. Uh, Casper native and even grew up on a sheep ranch, so of course I have to come to Microsoft to go learn about blockchain and calf meat provenance and such things that we'll learn about tonight. Um, that is not where I thought the Microsoft job would go, was back to ag, but isn't that great? Um, so we have, we have quite a panel of experts here tonight. I will tell you I'm the least knowledgeable on stage about blockchain, um, but that's good because I'm the one asking the questions, right? So that actually makes me less nervous. Um, 
about a year ago, we entered, you know, what was a very interesting session for our legislature. We've we've got a ton of the the budget issues, you know, with uh, coal prices down, natural gas prices down, oil prices down, which set a bit of a structural deficit in our in our budget. Um, some of that work for for people like Representative uh, Jared Olson is to go look at. How many buses are running in a school district? How do the game and fish need new trucks this year? Can they wait two more years? You know, a lot of, a lot of these areas where we try to, to trim the budget. But a, the bigger thinking part is how can we raise new revenue, different revenue, and diversify those income sources that maybe aren't from our traditional sources like fossil fuels? And how can we do that in a way that maybe doesn't cost the state a ton of money to boot? And I would say the blockchain suite of bills that we'll, we'll talk about tonight and maybe future ones um, really did create uh, a, a big bet, you know, a moonshot bet by the state of Wyoming in a very exciting way. Um, it ties and tailors into all the work that Governor Meads laid out in the Endow um, initiative to try and diversify our economy over the next 20, 25 years. And to be in a, you know, we're really right in the cusp of a fourth industrial revolution where things are going to change more about how our workplace is, how our economy is structured than they have in 100 years. Um, that, at least that's the opinion of, of the company I work for at Microsoft. And so with all these changes where, you know, if I told you 10 years ago there would be self-driving semis on the highway, you would have laughed at me, that you would jump in an airplane driven by a, a robot and not a human, you would have said, hell no, and you may still say that. Heck no, excuse me for the recording. Um, but these things are happening real time, and they're, they're coming up quicker and quicker, and blockchain is perhaps... The, one of the highest potential applications to, to really drastically change our economy, make it more efficient and much better and transparent. Um, one thing I'd like to do before I, I um, move to our first presenters is just to get a sense of the room for our presenters at what level to speak. Um, maybe raise your hand. Are you a blockchain expert in your mind? And you don't have to be humble here. Who knows a lot about blockchain? Okay, a couple guys are like, uh, okay. Great. Uh, who here has been reading all the news articles? Maybe you've read a book or some blogs on the internet and feel like you know enough to realize you don't know anything. That's me, actually. <laughs> I don't mean to put that on you all, but it truly is a, a very fascinating topic. And then last show of hands would be those who know little to nothing about blockchain. Okay. So you got a good, good diversity in the crowd. Watch those guys when they ask questions at the end. They know a little bit. Um, and so with that, I'd like to actually turn to our first presenters. This will be on how is blockchain impacting agriculture in Wyoming. Again, as a sheep herder, this is absurd for me to work for Microsoft and have blockchain people tell me where ag's going. It's, it's wonderful. Um, so we'd start with Phil Squared, Philip Schlump, and Philip Trek. And I believe you guys have microphones there. So if you'd like to go ahead and um, present, you have about 10 minutes to talk about blockchain affecting ag in Wyoming. Um, I'm CTO of a company that is tracking cows on the blockchain. Um, first thing I'd like to tell you about the blockchain is blockchain is kind of like the engine inside a car. It's not the car, but underneath the covers of things like Bitcoin, you have this engine, and it has a bunch of important properties. Some of those properties are things like you can't go back and change old data, and you can guarantee that once something is written, it's there forever. And when you're dealing with some sort of a supply chain where like cows are born and then they get passed between multiple different owners and you want to have proof that this is really happening, that you know your cow was fed all natural feed at the beginning or something like that, or that it's from Wyoming, to add some value to that cow in the process, there is incentives at every stage after the rancher to cheat. Everyone else, you know, if they can get more money for the cow because they can claim it's from Wyoming when it isn't, is incentivized to be able to go out there and cheat. And stopping cheating is to the advantage of the rancher. So a big part of tracking and providence of food is the fact that we can basically set up a system where the cheating isn't going to be part of the data. It's not going to happen. So that's really important. In some other states, like Washington, they're using the same stuff with a thing called PGP signatures to be able to notarize documents. The math behind PGP signatures is the exact same mathematics that we're using in a blockchain to guarantee that the cows, when they're Wyoming cows, are really Wyoming cows. And when a rancher tags a cow, 
scans that tag with an RFID into a system that's blockchain backed, essentially they're using the same level of security that you'd have in a notarized document at that instant. So you're guaranteeing into the future that things are true. Now, that's only part of the picture of, of tracking all of cows, but that's a big part in turning the process of tracking cows into a guaranteed reliable thing. It also means that when you track cows, you're going from a beginning with an individual cow where you can watch it go through the entire system and you can make certain that out, coming in, out the end, you can actually say, this is my stake on my plate. I've got a code for it. I can say, that stake claims to be organic, but I can you know, pull out my phone, scan the QR code, and I can get, this is when the cow was born, this is what ranch it came from, this is what it was fed all the way through the process, all the way to the plate. So that's a big deal to a lot of people. Yeah, I'm CTO of an agricultural company, or a blockchain company, uh, American Certified Brands, and we're tracking cows and sheep on the blockchain. It is really important in this entire process that security be maintained throughout, which is one of the things that's inherently provided by a blockchain, and that is um, guaranteed by the mathematical nature of the blockchain itself. Once a block is written, future blocks know about that block and you can't go back and change past history. Being able to not change history is very important to the entire supply chain. I know one of the things that has been drawn to my attention is I have a friend that works on Boeing and for bolts they have to go check every package because about every tenth load of bolts that they get has bad bolts in it that were produced that were not up to spec, and they're building airplanes. And that's because there's incentives inherently in a supply chain to cheat. If you can sell something for more than what it's worth, then you get away with a profit that you shouldn't get away with. And that's what happens in agriculture, too. There is a lot of food cheating going on, and a blockchain guarantees that as things are going through, you can't go back and change records, you can't falsify it, you can't make up fake data and then change it to something else. So that's a really important aspect of what we're doing. And I want to ask you about the finances of this, because that's important too. Hi, I'm Philip Tricad. I'm, uh, I'm maybe a little bit different approach to the whole blockchain thing. And, and I gotta say, I'm one of those people that I still haven't figured it out. In fact, the day that I figure it out is probably when the whole concept is over and done. So, um, and that just means that it's changing. But what I, I know a couple of things. Um, I've spent my life, my professional life, um, as an investor. And um, I was very fortunate. My timing was perfect. And I, I started the business, into the business in the 80s, the late 80s. And so the decade of the 90s, um, which were the solid days for my career, um, investing in, in tech companies and entertainment companies and insurance companies, everything. Because long-term reduction in interest rates, um, some pretty significant uh, technological advancements, especially as it related to semiconductor development and software that went on top of it. But um, long story short is what made it so easy is all I had to do is look for companies that provided a productivity edge to their clients. So it's it really simple. Now you think about the technology you see today, it's the exact opposite for the most part. I mean, social media, I'm telling you, is not productivity. It's not. It's the exact opposite. And so it doesn't mean that they haven't been wonderful investments, but they haven't produced what I would call economic good. And so blockchain comes along, and, and I should know it much better than I do. I, I was officing in San Francisco with, with uh, two young men that started the first real substantial venture capital uh, blockchain business, blockchain capital partners, Brad and, and um, um, Bart um, Stevens. So, and they're still they're going crazy. But I watched them from the start to the very you know where they're at today. You know, and uh, um, one thing that has impressed me along the ways is that the companies that are trying to develop these blockchain related businesses, um, by and large, it's all to drive productivity. It's not. I mean, there are some that are trying to sell. I don't know, skins for video gaming, something I still don't understand, <laughs> and no interest in either. So, um, but, but most of these, you read a white paper, these white papers are all trying to attack different industries, and a white paper is kind of like 
what a, uh, if, if you invested in a company, they would issue an, an S2 or an S4 that describes uh, the nature of their company and what they're trying to do. They're going to raise capital, maybe do an IPO, something like that. So a white paper is just that, where they write in this paper what their business proposition is. Now, the one thing that lacks from most of these white papers is any kind of economics. You know, they don't include a traditional income statement, cash flow statement, balance sheet. But they have an idea, kernel of a kernel of an idea and, and, and how they're going to attack a, d a different industry with using blockchain to produce economic results down the road. So read a bunch of these and it was really interesting and one day I was actually going to San Francisco, it was just this summer, and um, I ran into a fellow that I had seen at the blockchain um, legislation party when it passed. And I looked at him, he looked at me, and we were over in Laramie at the, if you guys ever go to the uh, uh, Turtle Rock, so shout out for Turtle Rock, greatest coffee place on the, on, in the state of Wyoming, in my opinion. But he, um, he said, yeah, I'm here, I'm here for the, uh, the blockchain uh, coalition meeting. I said, oh, they're having another one. I said, that's too bad, I'm, I'm going to San Francisco, so I, I, I would have attended, it'd been fun. He said, oh, that's all right. He said, so, and I asked him just haphazard, what are you up to? And he says, well, I'm involved in this beef chain company. I said, what's that? And he quickly described what they're trying to do and, and basically um, tag cows with RFID chips so that you could enter them on the blockchain and, and hopefully rationalize the supply chain. And so my immediate thought was, well, geez, I want to put my cousin's cows on that. So I said, can I get involved? And he said, sure. So we, um, I called my cousins there at the ranch south of Tensley and said, hey, you guys want to put your cows on the blockchain? They had no idea what I was talking about. And I said, I'll pay for it. So no, no money out of you. You don't have to worry about it. But I'll pay for it and let's see what happens. And so we did. Um, and one thing led to another. Um, and so I ended up getting more and more involved. And, and now I find myself CFO of the company. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, beware what you ask for. Um, so Phil wants me to talk about the financial aspects of it. Now you know how I got involved. Um, all I can tell you is this. It's like an onion, all right? Ranching is an onion. We have ranchers in this room, I'm certain of that. You understand what I'm talking about. It is not a simple business. It's actually quite complex. And it's as complex as you want it to be. And trying to use blockchain to solve the complexities of the ranching business has some pretty interesting attributes. But here's the problem. The problem is, is that ranchers don't collect data. Feeders don't, they do collect data, but they won't share it with the ranchers and they don't really share it up the chain to the processors either. There was a point in time where the feeders, the feedlots, were vertically integrated with the processors, but they both lost a boatload of money, so they don't do that anymore. So now it's three different islands of data. So that's your supply chain. Now, my heart is with the rancher, the producer. There's been no real technological innovation um, in ranching in 100 years. I mean, they, they breed cows better, no doubt about that. So genetics, there's been improvements. But I mean, think about it. There's been improvements in farm machinery. Um, they certainly can, you know, raise crops more efficiently than they've been able to in the past. But when it comes to raising a cow, not a lot of difference. Now, there's been um, some healthcare um, innovation, obviously, for your cows. But by and large, the business of, of doing a cow-calf operation has not changed. And so what I'd like to think is that this might be the first opportunity for technological innovation to really impact the ranching business. So my thought on this is that, and it's, a, and it's kind of a dream right now because we haven't been able to make it reality, you need to be able to have the ranchers and the feeders and the processors on the same level playing field. So think about this, you could be the best rancher in Wyoming or in the western United States. You could be raising the best cows out there. And once you sell your calf at 550 pounds or 600 into the feedlot, you know, in the fall, they go into a feedlot and then they, the feeder feeds it and then he sends it to the processor and the processor processes the animal and grades it, maybe. The rancher never ever finds out how his cows for the most part, rarely finds out how his cows graded. They could be prime, and they, he, they wouldn't know it. And so if we can bring transparency to the supply chain using blockchain, where we start tracking a cow right when we tag it, which generally is a branding. It could be at birth, but for the most part, it's with branding when they actually control the animal. And then um, collect data along the way. It could be 
um, where it's um, on pasture, uh, what it, what's the quality of the grass it's eating, the quality of the watershed. I mean, there's all kinds of data that we could capture. Um, we could say how many days of rain, you know, whatever the temperatures are. Um, you could track animal health by just its heart rate or its temperature if, if you have a sophisticated ear tag or some type of collar arrangement where you can capture that type of data. But in any event, you can start collecting this data. And then once you sell that animal into the feedlot, the vast majority of cows go to the feedlot. I mean, there's grass-fed cows. Most of those come from Argentina, Uruguay, or um, Australia, only because they really don't have a feedlot operation set up. The United States is unique in that, and that we try to grow our cows fast. So, but in any event, um, if you send a cow to a feedlot that has all this data behind it, if the feedlot then stops adding to it, the blockchain stops, right? You may know what happened to the cow early on if you go back to see that data, because we will keep track of our cows. But if they continue to add to the blockchain from there, you just add more information. And then that makes the cow, in my opinion, worth even more. Because ultimately, what we're trying to do is produce a steak on a plate where you can trace it all the way back to the source. Because people want to know what they're eating. And it's probably not a big deal in Cheyenne or Laramie or Wyoming in general because we pretty much trust the food we get. But if you live in Asia, that's a whole different story. You know, there's too many stories about you know, meat that's been delivered that's supposedly beef, and it turns out to be carob beef, which is not beef. That's water buffalo. Or it has kangaroo meat in it, or all kind of horse or whatever. So the Chinese and the other Asian um, consumers, you know, they're very concerned about where their food comes from. And so in order for us to be able to give them provenance all the way to the plate, we need to get those three entities to talk to each other. And information, as all you guys know, is money. And so if, you, if you're Cargill, for instance, Cargill made all its money because they had better information than the farmers they were buying corn from. They could buy the corn, store it, and then wait for the prices to come their way because they knew what was going on in Argentina. So that was a trading business. And that's why they have silos of information built up. So we've got to kind of break that down so we can show to everyone, look, everyone is better off when we have a transparent supply chain so that all parties in the, in the, in the mix can see what's going on. And so that's kind of where we're at. And if we can do that from a financial standpoint, everyone's going to be better off, including Beef Chain, the guys that are starting the whole process. So. Thank you. So that's a, that's a great kick in. And we'll do one more presentation and then jump into discussion and get a dive deeper into these issues. Um, but of note, I mean, even in the Denver Post today, it was 6.5 million pounds of beef recalled from an Arizona plant that has infected people, uh, you know, in 18 different states. And so to have that fence around the food quickly so it's less of an economic impact, I mean, can you imagine throwing away 6.5 million pounds of beef and you've transported it and now you're moving it again? It's just a, it's, we're better than that, right? And, so I, I didn't get it. Issue or um, Sal salmonella. Oh, salmonella. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, point being, I mean, even today, it's it's obviously needed. So, um, so our next short presentation will be on how could blockchain impact other industries, um, and on this one, we'll have uh, my boss nicknamed him the Jason Bourne of blockchain because David Murray grew up in Cheyenne but now lives in Switzerland. He speaks Spanish to his children. He runs all over the world, globe trouting on blockchain. So he's our Jason Bourne. Um, and it's hard to follow that for our next speaker. Um, but Jim Caldwell, who's the uh, professor and department head of the computer science department at the School of Engineering in, in Laramie. And so they're going to each take a couple, five minutes and just talk about other industries that could be impacted as well. Thanks, Dennis. So yeah, as you mentioned, I'm from Cheyenne here originally, but uh, kind of zigzagging all over the planet for a dif different causes and things. Uh, I ended up in Europe and wanted to go to Switzerland um, to try to find some solid rules and, and how they can do this. And so Switzerland really figured out this you know, quite early. And they became the leaders, Zurich and Zug, and the kind of the Germanic northern part. And, and then Germany, and I ended up in Germany. and um, I just had a baby there and spent a lot of time there. But uh, it's, a, it's an interesting place in the language. But, you know, they've, they've really figured it out. And I just became totally fascinated with all the use cases of the multiple, you know, just multitude of, of things you can do with this. It's really 
kind of, you know, like the onion analogy, if we want to keep going, it just again and again just keeps peeling back and you, another thing and that opens something else up. And so we really don't, it's in such infancy, we don't know where this is going. It, but it's, it's going in a big way. We do know that. And so the final destination, you know, I, I don't think there's probably any experts alive today for this technology is it's, it's just so new. You know, I think there's a pretty good, good grasp of it here, but it's still going to just keep evolving. And so I don't think anybody's too late to get in on this as it's all just starting. Um, you know, and I'm a big foodie, and so I'm, I'm a big fan of, of knowing where the you know, actual food comes from. But I'm more of the quality food, not trying to avoid recalls, obviously, as well, t toxic stuff. But, you know, I, I prefer to go to try to set the bar a little bit higher. And so I found this for, for food is just, you know, incredible. We don't half of the organic food around the world that's sold, it's not organic, you know. And... And so that's just you know one industry and one use case in Wyoming. That's you know, there's a lot of ag going on here, a lot of a lot of cattle. Um, I grew up raising some cattle myself, and so you know it's 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 interesting where this leads to, and, and this legislation is a is a huge part of that. So I'd come back um, just conveniently timed for a family reunion over the holidays, and then I saw this popping up and said, "Wow, this is just." I got to get in on this, and it's just amazing. It's happening in my hometown, you know. Like, so what a reason to come back to Wyoming and 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 get involved. And so it's just been, you know, really, a, you know, mushrooming out of, you know, into different spaces really quickly. And this next legislative session as well is going to be very interesting. Um, but I'm just still totally floored with the the, the variety of use cases. And so I, I want to maybe pick Jim's brain a little bit on what passionate, you know things he sees coming down the pike and what, what can really uh, uh, be a big influence on Wyoming. And we're, you know, ag and then energy and minerals are another couple of big issues here. And, and so how, how those industries specifically will, will evolve and change and become better. And, and I know um, I'd seen today uh, Senator Driscoll in, in Taipei, and he'd mentioned a, a coal-fired plant that's buying Wyoming coal. But is it all, how much, and all this data, and the, the, the numbers are, are not quite clear, and so they would prefer to have more transparency and, and better markets for the producers, like in the, the rancher's case, that they can prove that it's, it's quality beef, and it is grass-fed, and it is what you, you know, say it is, and so you know, I'm really excited to see where this can go, and uh, maybe with that, Jim, if you want to enlighten us on something that you're, you're passionate about for Wyoming. So I'm Jim Caldwell, I'm the head of the computer science department at the University of Wyoming. And um, I'm going to back up, I'm not going to answer your question right away. And I just want, I, I feel like maybe just the video alone might not have been enough to sort of place in people's minds exactly what blockchain is. And I wish David Pope, uh, who couldn't make it tonight, was here, because he's an accountant. And um, I presented on a panel to the Wyoming Economic Development folks, I don't know, last year, around this time. And I was walking my dog in the morning, thinking, what am I going to say to these people about this? Because so, it's, you know, it's economic development people who are in every little town and throughout Wyoming. They come all over, from all over. And I thought to myself, this is actually the first advance in accounting since double entry bookkeeping was invented in the Renaissance. And so I said that, and David Pope, who's an accountant, and Dick McGinnity, who's in the College of Business, were there, and they said, yeah, that's right. So really, we ha so what is the advance that's provided by this is that you cannot forge a blockchain. So it's a mechanism of keeping a ledger that is unforgeable. Every entry, once it's added, once all those distributed nodes agree, yes, and it's added to the blockchain, everyone has a copy. So that gives a certain amount, that gives it a, a strong, very strong security to the blockchain that it can't be forged. But it's also that everyone can look and see what the transactions were that were on the blockchain. So you have a distributed ledger, which is unforgeable. And so 
this can eliminate, David Pope has some excellent examples of how, for example, we've had some fraud in Wyoming with, you know, some uh, local city manager ordering a bunch of uh, vehicles and then never having, you know, and had an agreement with an auto dealer and they got the money in and he just paid the money back out and the cars were never delivered. That could never happen on the, if, the, if, the, if the transactions were recorded in the blockchain. So a blockchain, the way to think of it is it's an unforgeable distributed ledger that's stored across the internet. Now, a lot of people also have a confusion, or, um, and maybe rightly so, that blockchain is the same as Bitcoin, or blockchain is the same as cryptocurrency. And that is, it is the case that Bitcoin was the first application that really put blockchain out there. And it's an ingenious mechanism. Um, it has, Bitcoin itself has never been hacked. And it's been around since when? 2009? 2009. 2009 was the first uh, Bitcoins went out. And um, so since 2009, there have been, a, every hacker in the world has tried his hand at hacking the Bitcoin mechanism, and it hasn't been hacked. Now, you may hear about Bitcoin hacks, but those are hacks of companies that are holding Bitcoins, for example. It's not the Bitcoin mechanism itself, and the Bitcoin mechanism itself is built using blockchain. So that is a kind of a proof of concept of the security of this mechanism that you know you couldn't possibly buy, right? We've got 2009. Every hacker in the world trying to break this. Now, there's a lot of concern about the volatility of cryptocurrencies, and that may be well founded. I don't personally own any cryptocurrency. I think Dick McGinnity told me that he bought one Bitcoin uh, just to see what the mechanism was to go through. I think he bought it when it was at the top of around 20,000. <laughs> so he's not that happy with it. Um, but the blockchain, blockchain technology is, is what's used in Bitcoin, but blockchain technology is not Bitcoin. So blockchain technology is the underlying technology that allows for a, an unforgeable digital ledger that uh, also is highly secure because of its distributed nature. So I think, I don't know, I hope that maybe clears it up uh, or makes it a little bit clearer. It helped me to try to think about it in terms of an advance in accounting, and it really is. And uh, David Pope and Dick McGinnity both say, yeah, that's a, in fact, I just saw an article the other night I think about uh, using, reusing, uh, you know, I felt, oh wow, I came up with that idea six months ago. <laughs> so, anyway, using that idea to push, push the idea. So, now it's, so when is it usable? When is it useful? It's useful whenever you're trying to do transactions between two parties who may not have every reason to trust one another. So right now, for example, um, when I drove, drive home, I'm going to have to get some gas, and I'll use my Visa card. So what happens is the gas station trusts Visa, and I trust Visa, and it's a centralized repository for that transaction to go through. What blockchain allows is for the transaction to be done without any individual centralized trusted agent to be the one. It's trusted because the network itself is trusted and that the transactions are being recorded and distributed across the entire network and anyone can look at it to verify that in fact the transaction is, has uh, been made. 
I'll just say one more, one more thing, which is, if you haven't seen it, you might look at John Oliver, uh, who has like a Sunday night program on HBO. He did a piece on cryptocurrency, not blockchain specifically, but cryptocurrency. And he's, he basically started off by saying, well, what is cryptocurrency? And a little bit um, more profane than I am, he said, um, it's everything you don't understand about money together with everything you don't know about computing. And it really is kind of the space. I mean, it depends on extremely sophisticated underlying algorithms. So that's the hard part of the computing is the algorithms that are running, that are used to update the chain to ensure that it's unforgeable. And then money is an extremely abstract thing, really, if you think about it. I mean, why is a dollar in your pocket worth a dollar? And so, I don't know, I guess I'll just leave you with that. Um, I think it was, a, it was a very funny piece. So if you, if you Google John Oliver and um, cryptocurrency, I think you'll be able to find it. Well, and so let me I, throw out a, my first question to the panel, um, whoever would like to grab this. So I've, I've read an article that, that blockchain has been around since the 1990s as a technology. And obviously, you know, when a, when a car is invented, it may take 30 years for people to adopt that technology. Um, so that's not totally uncommon. But, but why is it that blockchain seems to be coming into its own in a global fashion, that there's people in a library in Cheyenne, Wyoming, talking about it? Um, why now? Um, does anybody want to mention anything about that? It turns out that there's a lot of evidence that most research takes 20 years to go from research to reality. In 1972, the Department of Transportation came out with a six-year study for a thing called kinetic safety bumpers, and these were bumpers that would absorb shocks and save a lot of lives. In 1992, you actually saw them on cars. Uh, 23 years ago, uh, the Stanley DARPA challenge, or the DARPA challenge was run by a car called Stanley that was self-driving across the desert. And today, I see news from Google that they are actually publicly available today, uh, self-driving taxis with nobody at the wheel at all. So that's taken 23 years. So the question of why does it take something like 20 years is because that's actually a really normal thing to see. It's not, things do not happen as fast as we would like to. And there's always, you know, the hype at the beginning of, how this is going to change the world. So this isn't the only thing. I think it's 11 years since Ten since years. we had uh, the genetic um, gene uh, sequencing of a human. And we're not there yet, but I expect in another eight or nine years, you're going to start to see some really big things coming out of it. It takes that long. I just add that I think the earliest kind of incarnations that the, um, were developed by the NSA for keeping secure records, and it took a long time to get out. And then, um, you know, the Bitcoin designer, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, who, it, 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 the whole thing is insane, right? <laughs> this guy, no one knows who he is. <laughs> um, Anyway, he published the paper and implemented the thing all in the open. You can go, you, any one of you could go and try and find the source and take a look at the source code that implements Bitcoin. It's all for public inspection. It's all open for public inspection. But it, took, it did take a long time, and I think that really 2009 is not that long ago that the real first kind of proof of concept implementation that I know of, aside from maybe secret ones that the National Security Agency had um, throughout there. I'll, I'll add, yeah, kind of this, you know, the necessity is the mother of all invention, and that was at the, 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 the big recession, and a great recession, however they're going to name it in the end, but um, 2008, and actually in the Genesis block, there's a, like a timestamp of a, a, new, a London front page paper of the Chancellor approving another bailout or mulling another bailout. Can you hear him in the back? Um, and so it was, you know, that, that brought it to the forefront and that application of a usable application in different places like 
uh, Cyprus and Argentina with currency controls where they couldn't transfer money and convert dollars and different rates. And so Buenos Aires started up as a, as a hub because of necessity. Uh, Cyprus and the Univers University of Nicosia uh, because their banking system got shut down for some time, uh, a long time ago. And so they said, hey, here's a solution, you know, and here's an application that, that people can do without this, like the, the visa analogy is a central operator. And so they could do, people peer to peer, country to country could do this without, uh, with, without somebody saying they couldn't. And so they needed to do that. They needed, uh, you know, a banking system as it was shut down, like in Cyprus. And so, you know, that was, you know, what really brought it to the forefront. Now we're 10 years on from that to see a whole multitude of applications. So, what do you have that mic, Dave? Um, I think these use cases are helpful for people to understand. You know, when you give the visa example, I'm like, oh, totally, I get it. So, what, what's a project you've worked on or working on or have seen, you know, that's a, that's a sort of explains to folks the benefit of blockchain in a, in a use case. So what's something you've seen, you know, maybe in a, another country or even in our country that's going to concept now or going to proof of concept now and is providing value to, to consumers? Yeah, well, I mean, which to pick from, really. Um, there's, there's so many. Uh, Walmart just announced that they're requiring every producer. Uh, this is just uh, last week, I believe. Every producer of produce to go into Walmart on that 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 you know recall spectrum side of quality, um, and you know the, the Chinese example is there is a lot of fraud and there's a lot of um, you know ec ec economic incentive built into that supply chain to promote fraud, and so you know that Walmart example is is quite you know is is huge out there, and that's that food safety network and um, whether well, there's there's so many, but energy I, I like one of. Uh, small communities and microgrids uh, being able to, where there's excess solar, that they can then sell directly to their neighbor that needs power. They have too much and they, they could sell it directly without having you know, to be middlemanned by some company to then sell it back to their neighbor that's going to consume it anyway. So, you know, it's not really fair to that producer uh, to, to get fair economic value of, of what they're creating. And like I said, Social media is probably not too valuable in, in all the, the creation of things, producing. <laughs> so, uh, did you say I have a question? Yes, sir. Yes. Just from a, a man's perspective, can ask I have here, is that I can remember investing in companies like General Magic and Apple when they came out with the new of all things. I owned a new, and I also had one of those General Magic things. And, and the whole point is, is that it's like an engineering roadmap. In the beginning, you don't have enough programmers and device manufacturers and you know analog experts and all those all those type of people trained in the new medium. And it takes time to develop a body of of developers. And that's why when you look at what's going on with blockchain right now, there's it, it would appear on any given day that oh this you know it's, like, it's going to never come around. It's just going to take way too long. And that's, it always feels that way. But you have to understand is that once you get critical mass of developers, it's kind of like your elbow. That's when it starts to take off. And I don't know if we're 10 years away, five years away, or 10 minutes away. Don't know. We don't know. But I'll tell you this, it's going to happen. So when you think about for your own perspective, where you work, how you invest, you know, how you consume, you should think about this. Because ultimately, it will impact it. I saw, so this article that Jim sent out, that basically it said blockchain is going to really um, upend the accounting industry. And I have to tell you, I, I read the article, and I looked at the uh, um, who contributed to it, and Dick McGinnity was one of the contributors. So he stole your idea and gave it to that guy. <laughs> so, but in any event, um, you have to, you can't ignore it. If you're an accountant and you're thinking, you know, I'm going to retire in 10 years, I don't need to worry about this stuff. That's probably, probably not a good idea. Not a good idea because you don't have 10 years. You need to, you know, stay on top of what's going on because it's changing rapidly under the covers where you can't see it. Um, so we've talked for almost an hour now on just what blockchain is, and I think we all have a, a bit better understanding. Um, I'd love to next go to Representative Olson, uh, Jared Olson up here, who's not yet had a chance to talk. 
Um, he, he serves in the House of Representatives at the Wyoming Legislature in a district just to the east of us here and, and extending across town. Um, and was integral with several other legislators in, in the bills we passed. And so do you want to take a stab at sort of what did our legislature do that was unique? Why does that have people even at my company in New York calling me about what we're doing? Uh, when I go to the blockchain hackathon that many of you were involved with in Laramie a month ago, I thought it would be UW students. No, it was like grown 65-year-old men from Colorado, from New Mexico, people coming from not the normal people that come to Laramie on a Saturday when there's no football game. And you're just like, who are all these people coming in? And so what, what did you all do at the legislature that has put us on the map as a, as a real progressive, forward-thinking state and blockchain? Yeah, thank you. So to, I guess, back it up just for one moment and, and talk about why this is so important for Wyoming, as we entered um, our session two years ago, many of you uh, should be familiar with this, we faced a double deficit in Wyoming, a deficit in our general budget and a deficit in our education foundation budget. So a tremendous uh, amount of money that needed to be made up, and that means either new revenue generators or uh, changing your budget. And as I'm sure everyone is well aware in the room, uh, Wyoming is an industry uh, state led by minerals and close somewhere above 60 percent of our entire education foundation budget is dependent on three different minerals coal oil and gas and the bulk of our general budget really depends on that too it derives it from property taxes and and taxes severance taxes on those industries so when those industries do poor Wyoming's economy does poor so as we entered the session the question on all of our minds was not just how do we change the budget, but how do we fundamentally change, at least for some of us legislators, how do we fundamentally change the economy of Wyoming? And that means diversification. And so a few of us uh, really jumped on the bandwagon for this blockchain idea, uh, primarily championed by uh, Representative Tyler Lindholm from Sundance. Uh, there are five bills, and I was a sponsor of one of those five and a co-sponsor on all five of the bills and uh, worked hand in hand with Representative Lindholm to bring the, the bills forward on that idea. We were all interested in, in diversifying our economy. Um, and then there's a task force that we created and I wanna talk about that uh, briefly as well, but I wanna walk you through those, those five bills so you can understand kind of the foundation of how things changed in Wyoming. The, the first and probably the most, I, I would call it earth shattering, um, of the legislation dealt with utility tokens. And so what Wyoming did was pass a law that took these utility tokens and defined them essentially as personal property instead of as a security interest. And why, is that, uh, why does that matter so much? Well, we were the first government in the world to do that. The first in the world, not just in the country, but in the world. And uh, so, so some of these folks who are, are far brighter on this topic than me can speak to how that's evolving throughout the world uh, based on, on some of the legislation we've done. So that's kind of the, the forefront, the first. And how does that impact our economy? Well, it brings in um, individuals who want to create a token in Wyoming. So they create the token, they register it with our Secretary of State's um, division. They pay a fee, of course. And if they bring their company here, even more if they buy property here for their company or lease property, even more revenue gets generated into local communities and, and state communities. That's the biggest of the five. The, the second largest, I would say, dealt with the Wyoming um, Money Transmitter Act. And so prior to this bill, there was a lot of skepticism on whether you could actually possess, trade, sell, um, a Bitcoin or, or, or any type of cryptocurrency, a virtual currency. This bill exempted uh, the process of holding, buying, selling, issuing, transmitting um, virtual currencies from our Wyoming Transmitter Act and, and opened that door for economic activity. So that's, that's above and beyond the blockchain as was described by some of our panelists earlier. Cryptocurrency and, and blockchain are two different things. But uh, this, this specific bill opened the world for, for our currencies. Next dealt with, uh, the next piece of legislation dealt with corporate and electronic records. So we had to actually free up regulation to allow companies, private companies, 
to um, hold administered records on a distributed or electronic network or database. And our Corporations Act just simply didn't allow for that. So we, we peeled back that regulation to allow for that. And uh, the idea of that is not just in the private world, but in the public world. The idea is to extend that into maybe most, most hopefully at one day, all of our government entities. Other um, nation states around the world are already experimenting with that, uh, particularly in the, uh, the old Soviet area, the Eastern um, European states have begun to uh, put their property records on a blockchain. And, uh, and we'll talk more about that later if we get an opportunity because that is part of what our task force is looking at. And, and just two more. Just oh, ask, yeah. Could you mention what a utility token is? I'm probably the least qualified or, person. Or to someone on this panel. You're, you're surrounded by experts. So. One of the things we're doing with cows is we're actually setting up the cows so that each cow is associated with a utility token so that you can actually buy a cow off of um, the a uh, exchange. And the reason why this is important has to do with financing of ranches, but a good way to look at a utility token is that it is a license or an ownership of some physical thing or a right to use something. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add as well on this, the utility token bill. It's, it, it reached all the corners of the planet that typically I was the lone American or you know kind of crazy guy in the, in the group that would Wait, aren't you from Wyoming, right? Right, and what? The, the, what are they doing over there? And he would hear, and that was the that was the big one that really, really put Wyoming on the map. Was the first, and that beat Switzerland out by by creating a lot of um, rules around it. But the first elected body to actually clearly define what this was, they had some like kind of the SEC's version of rules around it, but it still wasn't law. And so that's another huge first for the state of Wyoming. And, and yeah, thank you for. We're working on that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And to expand upon that, why does that matter? If you were to, if, in my mind, if I were to compare it to something in the economic world that really took off, I would look at limited liability companies, for example, and how Delaware really hit the map in that. And if any of you follow the corporate world, whether that's corporations actually or companies, uh, Delaware is the king of that. And so their state actually generates billions of dollars um, in revenue and achievement revenue off of the creation of new limited liability companies. In fact, the revenue that they generate dwarfs the budget of the state of Wyoming. And so the concept is, what if we were king of the utility token? What if we were king of that here in Wyoming? Well, then, then maybe we could generate billions of dollars worth of revenue like Delaware does um, in the corporate world for the entire world. And so just, um, just some food for thought there on, you know, and I throw that out there because as I go around the state, I. I get asked the question a lot, what is, what is this doing for Wyoming? And when we only have um, a dozen or so registered utility tokens in the state, I can understand that skepticism, but this is only months old. And so a lot of these folks are talking about how it may take a decade to see a lot of, a lot of this come to fruition in the, in the technological world or in any advancement world. And I believe that's true too. And so. So you may, you know, the whole idea is that we're going to see that, that revenue boost. Um, the last two pieces of legislation. Um, next, we, we brought a bill that exempted um, virtual currencies um, from taxation. So because we defined them as personal property, they would be subject to taxation, but we exempted them. The idea, again, there is to encourage economic um, economic uh, development by exempting it and not thwarting it early on in its infancy stages. And then the last bill, particularly uh, a favorite of mine because I, I wrote it and authored it and sponsored it, and that's the uh, Limited Liability um, Series Act. And so a little bit different here, we've talked about tokens, we've talked about blockchain, uh, but the next thing that Wyoming did was pass a law allowing for the creation of series limited liability companies which um, is a unique type of, of entity on the world stage. Uh, it is an entity that exists in Delaware, uh, but I believe um, that uh, Wyoming, for all of our other corporate tax reasons, um, taxation across the board reasons, uh, should invite greater creation of this company in our state. This is a particular entity that is very, um, that I would say the blockchain developing world is very fond of, particularly in the Internet of Things 
uh, conversation where we talk about uh, these little devices and what is that. So an Internet of Things is, is like Alexa or Google Home or um, your, a smartphone or um, a smart toaster or an, a smart vacuum. All of these little things um, that we are now connecting our world into. Um, people are beginning to generate more and more of, of these entities um, in their lives. In fact, I've been meeting with um, some folks out of California who are developing um, smart homes. And they want to build smart homes right here in Wyoming. And of course, everything in it is an Internet of Thing, basically. And so they want to put those into different types of limited liability companies. They want to put each smart home into different types of limited liability companies uh, in order to shield liability, provide um, uh, different types of security, and of course, um, different levels of um, privacy. And so a very, a very attractive form of company for Wyoming. And that, that's the map of the legislation. We brought forth five, five bills. All five uh, were signed into law by the governor. And uh, one more piece we added to that. In fact, the joke became in the legislature that blockchain really means an infinite stream of bills because we, we actually started with three. And as we were going, we got so excited about it that we started adding legislation onto it. And the last piece we added was um, something I sponsored as well. I sponsored the uh, amendment, the budget amendment, to create a blockchain task force along with a mirrored budget in the Senate by my colleague, um, Senator Rothfuss. And we created uh, this task force that uh, includes two representatives, two senators, and then folks from our community. And we have met twice now. And I, oh, I think everybody here has been to our task force meetings. We've met across the state of Wyoming and Laramie and Jackson. And we'll be meeting again here at the end of this month in Cheyenne. And the purpose of that task force is to do two things. It's to, one, keep our thumbs on all of this. Because as, as uh, many of the panelists alluded to here, uh, this, they would be lying to you if they told you they knew everything about blockchain. And I would be doing the same thing as a legislator. And so the most prudent thing we could do uh, in the legislature, I believe, is create a task force to watch it um, and watch the legislation that we enacted. And so we're going back and we're constantly um, looking at this and thinking of different ways to re-envision some of the legislation we have, as well as bringing in new um, and bolder innovative ideas, um, some of which I really think is they're going to move the ball even further than we are moving it right now um, world stage-wise. Uh, so some very exciting things coming out of that blockchain task force. Uh, thank you, Derek. And I should mention, if anybody has crowd questions, if you'd hold up your card you want a question asked, um, we can collect those and we'll turn to some uh, audience questions. Um, so one we have is uh, with, the, with the, I'll paraphrase, with the recent concern over impacts by foreign states or uh, you know, bad actors on elections, what, what are, how can blockchain help, say, our Secretary of State or Wyoming and our county clerks maintain the, um, that our elections are run well, safe, and are not altered by bad actors? And if you have a question, hold it up and we can come gather. Well, it's still a research area. But last uh, November, Governor Mead asked the Dean of the College of Engineering, can't you guys do something about voting technology with blockchain? And we had um, a faculty member who works in that area. I should mention also that Phil is teaching a blockchain development course for us right now for our students. And um, we put the course together um, a week before registration, which is not the ordinary thing and had 22 students take it and they were just essentially you know thrown in the deep end given the task design a blockchain voting system and they broke into different groups and i think some of the solutions were quite viable um, but i think it's still a um, it's still a, a research topic i don't know of any commercial vendor of electronic voting equipment that's uh, implemented based on blockchain. I don't know. Do you, Dave? Um, there are some voting 
pilots and projects going on and that are, are in the works and, and there's a couple in Switzerland that have been tested, uh, some smart identity. Uh, there's two different cantons like the states there that have done pilots and tests and, and they've approved it. Uh, there's not a lot of users signed up for it, which is pretty typical in the blockchain space, uh, but they've done a lot of the security checks and Switzerland's pretty rigorous, rigorous on that effect to make sure it's quite safe and, and tested. And, uh, you know, there's there's the option of sandboxes as well that, that they're setting up that there's a, a safe you know you know area that nothing can really happen. You can set up a program and 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 test it out quite well before it's turned out into the wild. And so um, we're pretty hopeful on that. And actually, at the hackathon, we had my my team had produced a project um, that's typically for the Secretary of State, and it's a portal so for entity registration, the Series LLC registration as well. Uh, to be able to um, register those entities online and then link it with your 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 wallet address, which is your your, your public key. And so, with Ethereum, we created a, a link there. So, as you register it, the, the entire creation of the entity is created on chain. So you can issue the articles of incorporation, the constitution, and everything else directly onto chain. Direct. So you could always point to that and say. You know, this is when that entity was created that we started trading this businesses live. And so you can even pay those fees and registration and everything uh, like as a service like the Secretary of State would use. So a lot of places are going down the road where it's called an API, where the, the entity then actually allows a programmable application that goes into uh, different interfaces, so like the, the database of the Secretary of State, for example. And so we're, we're, we're quite hopeful for... Um, all of these solutions to keep coming out and, and more more developers on the table as well to, to, to program in these languages and that, that is a big uh, hold up at the moment. Now there's a, a massive uh, glut in demand for high quality projects but very few competent programmers that actually understand this technology and so uh, another great opportunity for Wyoming. So David, while you have the mic, uh, this question direct um, from the card. David, is that my shirt? Dad. Um, yes, it is. It's a, it's a borrowed shirt. <laughs> getting, <laughs> getting back from task force, a little short on, <laughs> on laundry. Uh, thanks, Dad. Um, from a different person, actually, different handwriting. Um, so Mr. Murray has, has uh, published a book on blockchain. What is your book about? Uh, so a couple years ago with this obsession, I had published a book, um, self-published, about the kind of the, the macro uh, effects of inflationary currencies and deflationary currencies, which is kind of one of my, my interests is how I got to this was through economics. And so uh, as our, our only alternative or our only option of, of commerce today is, is fiat currencies, is US dollar, which is inflationary. So I, I learned that every year it's going to be worth less and it buys me less every single year. And that's the guarantee that I came across. And I wasn't too happy with that. Uh, it, was a, it was kind of a bitter day when I realized that that was happening over and over again. And then I learned about compounding interest when it happens over many years, and it's even worse. So I had kind of highlighted that and researching that, how it's amazing every single time that this experiment of purely fiat currency has ever been attempted, it's always collapsed, unfortunately. And so that's just kind of the history of it. Um, so whether this this experiment is, is exempt from that. I'm not too sure, but odds are pretty bad against that. And you know, the debt thing and the federal debt level and stuff is, is out of control. And now they don't even really care. They don't really talk about it. And it's like, oh, well, yeah, but that's always been like that. Well, actually, actually no, now it's, you know, since 2008, when I really got fascinated with this, it's the debt problem is maybe 100 times worse. Uh, so that's, now it's even a lot more difficult <laughs> to fix. So, um, and then the, 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 the latter part of the book is, is on the use cases and all the, the different industries. And I, I keep going through industry to industry to industry. And, you know, I keep finding more and more and more uses from this um, for transparency. And uh, but like Jim had said, it's a lot of accounting and optimization. And it's really a disintermediation, uh, this movement of removing all these uh, inefficient middlemen and sometimes even excessive politicians are middlemen. 
uh, I don't know if we need all of them, you know, but some of them, and it's a fine line, but um, there's, there's optimization in everything in government, I would say. And so actually our, our, our hackathon project, we won the governance uh, challenge by Consensus, which was, is actually a pretty interesting company in the Ethereum blockchain space. And so um, that was uh, quite, quite a, a big win for us. So, Representative Olson, you mentioned that uh, part of the impetus of doing the, the suite of bills last year was to try and diversify our economy. Um, and you did mention it's, it's early and the, the bills are taking form. Um, but are there businesses interested in coming to Wyoming because of the new legislation? Oh, ab absolutely. In fact, <clears throat> not just businesses coming to Wyoming, but businesses springing up in Wyoming. In fact, we, everyone was, we were talking about the beef at the beef chain. And that's probably one of the best examples, uh, I think, of a Wyoming-grown company. Um, and uh, Senator Driscoll, I, I wish he were here to speak about this and putting his, his cows on the chain as well. And so for Wyoming, a very applicable use of it is certainly um, cattle. But uh, other businesses um, as well. In fact, while we were moving the legislation uh, through the chambers, we had we had businesses from all over the world who were visiting uh, Wyoming from places like the Philippines and even Canada. And in fact, a company from Canada located its corporate, uh, one of its offices right here in Cheyenne, um, the second floor on the Paramount. And uh, so we, we're definitely attracting uh, blockchain developers. Um, I've met with uh, miners on the other side of this as well. So when we talk about um, the Bitcoin side of this, there's a, there's a side of mining the Bitcoin. And when I say miner, actually a miner is a computer. Um, in, this, in this world, it's not a person. But um, I've met with um, companies um, in the South who are entertaining the idea of, of bringing their mines here to Wyoming. The, interestingly, uh, we've created a perfect climate for that, but there's, there's one element missing, and it's actually our, uh, our cost for the use of energy. Believe it or not, we do not have the lowest cost for the use of energy, and these mines take a tremendous amount of energy. And in fact, in places like Arkansas, uh, you can mine cheaper than in Wyoming because of the, the locality uh, to hydro power, which um, in this, this particular mining company can get um, it much cheaper next to the hydropower than here in Wyoming. So something we're also going to be looking at in 2019 is trying to ad address the energy rates to make us more competitive um, for, uh, for that industry. So there's that as well. And then the last piece that I'm aware of is uh, Overstock. Overstock.com, huge, um, huge announcement uh, to begin um, citing some of its, uh, its coders and, and, and developers here uh, in, in Wyoming as well. So what we're seeing uh, right now is certainly a lot of activity outside of the state um, utilizing the regulations, but we are seeing um, definite, measurable amounts of companies who are, who are relocating. I'll just add to that a little bit. Since I'm the head of the computer science department, I get these uh, about once a month uh, for a long time. I would get an email, oh, we're interested in your department. Um, we're interested in your students mainly, hiring your students. And uh, over the years, I've had like three real, you know, I've had them roped in, I thought, to move to Laramie. And we really only got one, and that was UL. But since these bills have passed, I've had a number of contacts. And uh, you probably know, but maybe just forgot to mention, Active Ether, which is a Brooklyn-based company that showed up at the hackathon, is um, moving about half of their folks from Brooklyn. He doesn't want to uh, re dislocate the folks that had their kids in school and so forth, but they're moving, they're planning on moving to Jackson in January. And I'm, you know, in contact with a couple of other companies that are, you know, very interested in relocating to Laramie. And I have to say, since, since I've, been, I've been at UW 20 years, I've been department head for six years, I've never seen so much activity and in companies interested in coming to Wyoming. It's been great. Thank you. So for the, the next one, it's kind of a, two different questions in the same vein. 
Um, one, part A, would be how do we verify the integrity of the info in each block? And then the second part to that would be, could you describe how a person would view a block on the blockchain? Does it take the whole network to do this every time? Do you need a key to see it? Whoever would like to tackle those. So the question on how you would verify information on the blockchain is really two things. There's the question of how do you know that future information in a new block that came from a previous block is correct? And that is, by and large, guaranteed by a series of cryptographic steps that make certain that future data is correct. But when you input data into the blockchain, um, you know, people could put in false data. Okay, there's, there's two, two, two pieces to this. One thing is, is the false data. And for instance, in a cow-calf operation where you're claiming something like the cows are organic cows, okay? Um, certainly in our operation, we're going to have to go out and do some amount of auditing to make certain that the amount of feed, that the organic feed matches with the number of cows, that they're, if they have both organic and non-organic, that the non-organic feed doesn't like, they're buying a bunch, and the organic feed, they aren't buying much. So there's some stuff you have to do to make certain your input data is correct, and you don't get away from that. But the thing that it does get away from is people going back and changing the data later to fake it. And we've certainly seen in this country some real bad examples of faking data, no matter what you think about politics. One of the things that Paul Manafort got convicted for is going back and faking accounting records that were already there. Okay? And he got a felony conviction for that. And with a blockchain, you can't go back into the past and change things to make them look better. They are what they are. So the other question was, how do you look at the information in the block? How do you look at the information in the block? Every node in a blockchain has a complete copy of the information. And that means that if you have access to a node, you can go back and look at all the information throughout the history of that blockchain. In Bitcoin, there's around 8,000 nodes around the world. In Ethereum, the one that we're using for our product, there's something like 12,000 nodes. And when we set up and do software for it, we create a new node, and that node immediately goes out and gets a copy of all the information that's been in the past. So how do you look at it? There are tools out there like Etherscan that will let you scan through the blocks and look for specific things, in fact, quite efficiently. If you want to have a company that's using one of our bills and is registered and it's keeping track of its essentially stock on the blockchain, it's keeping track of its corporate records, you could go out in 30 or 40 seconds and pull back the information on every transaction that has ever happened in that company's stock. And you could see it and you would know that because of the nature of the blockchain you have accurate numbers. Some years ago, Dell Foods, when it was still public, was audited. And at that time, and this is a multi-billion dollar corporation, they figured that about a third of the stock of this multi-billion dollar corporation wasn't even real. It was a figment of imagination, okay? Because of high-speed trading and the fact that it really takes two days for stocks to clear. And we're talking about billions of dollars of money that's trading hands and isn't, doesn't even exist. Okay, and shouldn't exist. There should only be so many stocks, and there was way more in trade than the actual number. Something like a blockchain for regulating the stocks on a company guarantees that you have actual ownership, that you have the number of shares out there that are supposed to be there, and you can use a tool like Etherscan to go out and count them and see exactly who owns them and exactly how many there are. There's no fakes. Example, and it was pretty funny that it was so complex that Dole just kind of threw their hands up and said, we don't know which ones are real and which ones aren't, and paid everybody out. So it was a huge, huge it would have been a huge benefit for them to have issued on, on, on a blockchain, to have a, a real record of, and all of those shares were issued from a, a, a legitimate broker. And so there was no able for them to, it would take them 10 years to probably unwind of what, what exactly went out, and so they just went ahead with it. And that's a huge problem for some people on the end. <laughs> so, so some folks um, feel Bitcoin is used in illegal operations, whether it's human trafficking or, you know, you hear the dark web type activities. 
Um, and that's, a, you know, you assume that because it's not traceable. Um, but we've heard tonight that blockchain is transparent and immutable. So could someone address sort of this contradiction and views? There's way more bad stuff happening with cash than Bitcoin can ever, ever imagine. <laughs> Do you want, you want to talk okay. about the encryption of the records of, of identities, identity encryption? It does give you. There's some feeling that you have anonymity on the blockchain because your account doesn't have a name tied to it, it's just a number. But in reality, the one thing you can say about blockchain is that every transaction in Bitcoin, every transaction in Ethereum, back to the very first one, you can trace every billionth of a cent of it, literally, to exactly where it came from. And, you know, I'm certain no one in here goes and pays their auto mechanic in cash and the guy gives you a discount, but that's actually tax fraud going on right in front of your face. And you know, this happens everywhere, okay, with cash. The difference is there's no tracing at all. Whereas in blockchain, there really is traceability. And if you want to guarantee that these things are truly traceable, what you have to do is you have to tie a real person's name to it, which hasn't been done yet. But if we had real names tied to real addresses in these coin systems, that would be the end of the black market, literally. There, you couldn't have it. It wouldn't happen. Yeah, uh, you know, all, you know, some different ATM machines across the planet, different inner city ATM machines, uh, it would be a very high percentage that goes to illicit activities. And the banks know that, you know? And, uh, like, it, for me, is a tough one to say. Are they complicit? Are they? I mean, they know it's going on, but they well, they just take the machine out, you know, and, and they take it. And it's their out of their hands. But there was a case with a company um, with the dark web, and they made an example out of this guy, and he got sentenced to life. Uh, and he was basically saying, you yeah, know, I'm not actually buying or selling any drugs, but some people are using that for that, and. Is it fair in comparison to this, the ATM example of, of these banks? And they're doing the exact same thing. So I, I kind of feel for this guy that, you know, he was made an example of. But you know, at the same time, we need more more transparency with with linking uh, a lot of these transactions, and they are all tracked. Okay, so we have time. We're coming up on the hour. Two more quick questions. Um, maybe not so quick. Without a middleman, perhaps government to safeguard, what is there to prevent unbridled speculation and protect economies and investors? Maybe not a quick one, sorry. So without some sort of middleman, perhaps government to safeguard, it's sort of the, you know, in a free market, you have the policeman that's got to make sure people are on the up and up. Um, what is there to prevent unbridled speculation I, to protect economies and investors from bad actors? Well, I mean, I'm a skeptic. I mean, I, I have, I've been in this business way too long, and I've seen way too many bad actors get away with what I mean. Look, in 2008, did a single person go to jail? Did a single banker go to jail? No. Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart went to jail. <laughs> but she, went, she didn't go to jail during 2008 for committing bank fraud and, and, and the rest. She just um, traded a security. And uh, what she make, $16,000? Right. Yeah, OK. So um, the whole, I, again, the whole concept of safeguards, and it goes back to using Bitcoin to do bad things. I mean, cash is your enemy if you're worried about that. And the current markets as they exist today, the, the supposed Regulating um, authorities have a hard time regulating. I mean, just is the way it is. But um, in terms of speculation, that's tough. I do feel bad about the speculative, especially in the in the cryptocurrency space. The companies that were issuing these coins. So I'm a little bit I'm a little bit torn on this. So companies are issuing these coins. So forget about Bitcoin and Ether, you know, the big ones. But all those little companies that issued coins that. Um, went up in value. There's really no regulatory police, so to speak, in those markets. And so there was rampant um, manipulation of the underlying coins. 
And the video that, that Jim mentioned, um, what's the name of that guy again? The, the, um, the comedian that did the... Oh, oh, oh. You really should watch John this. Oliver. John Oliver. You should, yeah. you should watch this. It's unbelievable. He points out and he shows how they manipulate these different coins. They'll get a, a group of people out there to try to push it up in price, and they sell it all at the same time, and it happens, but there's no, the SEC isn't actually sitting on top of those um, exchanges um, or where it's occurring to try to regulate that. So there's a lot of that stuff that goes on. And from a professional investor standpoint, that makes me, that, that's just, that's, that's not right. It's not good, and there's a lot of speculation. So in any event, that's um, it's hard. Humans like to speculate. I'll just say, though, that to go back to the separation from cryptocurrency from blockchain-based technology is that I kind of that's the important separate thing. Yes, cryptocurrency is a very complicated and uh, difficult space, but blockchain is being implemented and used. IBM is the number one player large corporate player in this space. Walmart, there's over, a, this was six months ago, had over a million different items on their shelves that were being tracked by blockchain. It's being used in China to follow, to do the kind of work that the beef chain folks are doing to have the provenance to be able to say, where does the food come from? I mean, um, you know, uh, counterfeit, items in the Chinese economy are like their number one problem. And they're implementing blockchain to keep track of all the transactions, where it goes from. Is, you know, cigarettes is an example that's been given to me a number of times. Like counterfeit cigarettes are like one of the biggest businesses in China. So how do you know that when you buy a pack of Marlboro that looks like Marlboro's that they're actually Marlboro's? Well, they're working, there's companies that are embedding chips in the packaging so that you can tell that. So I think that question is kind of like blurring again and, and maybe that uh, blurring that distinction between cryptocurrency and uh, more legitimate uses of blockchain to kind of make things flow better really is, is sort of the idea. A few weeks ago, IBM announced that in conjunction with Merrick, which is one of the largest container shipping companies in the world, that they had done a blockchain implementation that reduces Merrick shipping time for containers by 40%. And I'm certain that every shipping company in the world is looking at that going, we have to do that. That is a huge change in international shipping. And I know I finally got a hold of somebody that's involved in the project and asked them what they're doing. And they said, the primary thing is we can guarantee that containers arrive at the right time to be put onto a boat with blockchain so that we can straighten out the shipping. And this has nothing to do with cryptocurrency. It has to do with getting better tracking that's reliable across multiple companies in a supply chain. And that's the big thing that they're getting out of the blockchain. So we're at time. Uh, we have a few questions, obviously, we didn't get to, so I apologize for those. The good news is some of the panel members, I'm sure, are around. Their contact info is on one of these sheets uh, if you want to reach out and talk to them. Um, and then even better, in January 2019, there'll be a second part of this program. Tonight was sort of the first building block of getting a, a base understanding of blockchain. Um, as we go to January, they'll we'll look at a, a basics of cryptocurrency program and that the key of that timing is it's right as we're leading into a, a general session and a task force that's going to bring a slew of bills back so you, you've sort of seen what where we've been come back in a couple months and you can see where we're going and have and be armed with information to try and influence that for the best of Wyoming um, last thing I want to do is uh, thank all our panel members here Rachel Savota and her staff in the library for for hosting this uh, if we could give all those folks who participated a great round of applause. Thank you.